So I see it means okay, that's the flipping of the models, right? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nana Boku, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Boganaveli Singh. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Singh. The Registrar, Dr. Cleland, extends has sincerest apology for not joining us today. The registrar also extends a congratulations and warm wishes to Professor Singh. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. These lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. The lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to their peers in the academic sphere. Students and research collaborators are also the people that get an opportunity to learn more and confirm the successes of the inaugurant. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. I would like to acknowledge the following guests, members of the executive management, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Singh, family and friends of Professor Singh, academics and professional staff, students, alumni and distinguished guests. At this stage, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our Dean and Head of School, Professor Atemola Ola, Naren, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Singh. Thank you very much, um, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Agriculture Engineering and Science, Professor Abad Modi. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, and good afternoon to everyone present. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our inaugurant uh, for this afternoon, Professor Mogi Singh who is now a full professor of biochemistry within the School of Life Sciences in the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Durban, South Africa. Professor Singh received a BSc honors and MSc degree in biochemistry 
from the then University of Durban Westford. She later on obtained a PhD degree in biochemistry in 2005 from the University of KwaZulu Natal on the West V campus. Professor Mogi Singh joined the Department of Biochemistry in September 1987 as a junior laboratory technician and since then worked our way through the ranks of senior technicians, uh, becoming a lecturer in 2001, senior lecturer in 2008, associate professor 2017, and then full professor in 2020. During this time, Professor Singh held several positions at the university, including uh, serving as dean's assistant between 2005 and 2009, Deputy Head of School for Biochemistry, Microbiology, and Genetics between 2010 and 2011. Academic Leader for Teaching and Learning in 2014. Uh, and Academic Leader of Research and Postgraduate Studies between 2017 and 2018 within the School of Life Sciences. Professor Singh's research area is rooted in gene therapy and nanomedicine, with particular focus on non-viral or nanoparticle mediated gene and drug delivery. For the treatment of cancer. In addition, she is involved in research collaborations involving the testing of medicinal plants and novel synthesized chemical compounds for various biological activities, including anti cancer activity, with various researchers at UKZN, Northwest University, University of Zululand, and Water Zulu University. Professor Singh has successfully supervised and graduated 18 doctoral and 32 master's students. And she's also mentored six book doctoral fellows of which two are current and four NRF interns. She is currently supervising 12 doctoral and six masters and two honors students uh, in, within the School of Life Sciences. To date, Professor Singh has published over 145 papers, is Scopus and IS, ISI index journals. She also has published five book chapters 15 proceedings, and she has contributed 57 conference presentations. Notably, one of Prof Singh's papers published in the Journal of Pharmaceutics has been nominated for a highest cited paper award for 2021, the outcome of which will be announced next year. Professor Singh has examined a large number of MSc and PhD theses from different universities, both nationally and internationally, including uh, the ones from UKZN, WITS, University of Zululand, Durban University of Technology, University of Venda, University of Cape Town, University of the Western Cape, University of Limpopo, Rose University, Monash University, Malaysia, and the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research in India. In addition, she was part of the Scientific Organizing Committee for the 14th International Conference on Nanomedicine Drug Delivery and tissue engineering that took place in Rome, Italy in 2019. She also served as a promotion committee on promotion committee for Kuwait University in 2021 and as a panel member for peer review of the South Africa Medical Research Council VIT Antiviral Gene Therapy Unit for the University of VIT. Um, she is currently on the National Research Foundation Standing Panel for the Natural and Life Sciences which she has been from 2019 uh, to date. She has reviewed grants for the NRF, Belgium Foundation of Cancer, Fund for Scientific Research, uh, the WFO, w, uh, FWO Research Foundation Belgium, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Fellowship for Cochin University of Science and Technology, a postdoctoral grant for the Indian Institute of Technology in India. Professor Singh is currently a member of the editorial board of evidence-based complementary and alternative medicine, and has been invited to serve as a guest editor for the Journal of Oncology, Pharmaceutics, and Frontiers of Chemistry. She's a reviewer for more than 50 journals, including high impact journals such as Journal of Controlled Release, International Journal of Pharmaceutics, European Journal of Pharmaceutics, Pharmaceutics, Cancer, Biomedicine, Pharmaceuticals, Nanomaterials, Molecules, International, International Journal of Molecular Sciences, Current Nanosciences, Plus One, um, Journal of Drug Delivery Science and Technology, uh, Biomaterial Science, and so on and so forth. Professor Singh 
is a National Research Foundation seed field rated scientist since 2012 and has received several grants, including the Nanotechnology Flagship, International Bilateral and BRICS funding. Professor Singh has a Google Scholar H index of 27 and an I-10 index of 75 and over 2,200 citations to date. She has been among the top 30 researchers in UKZN for 2019 and 2020. Professor Singh has been an invited speaker at a number of international conferences in Singapore, Japan, USA, Italy, Poland, and Dubai, two of which she was um, a keynote speaker. She recently presented, represented South Africa in the Control Relief Society's international chapter featuring India, South Africa, and Turkey. She has served as a judge for presentations at the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy Annual Congress in Washington, USA, and as a sessional chair at the South African Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and the fourth international conference on nanomedicine, drug delivery, and tissue engineering in Italy. Professor Singh is a member of South African Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Uh, she's also a member of European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, International Society of Global Health, and the Control Release Society Local Chapter, South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure and honor that I invite Professor Singh to present our inaugural lecture titled, From Clusters to Stairs, It's All About Delivery. Thank you, Prof. Olani Ren, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. And I extend my warm and humble greetings to the BBC, the Dean, colleagues, families, guests, ladies and gentlemen, including students that are uh, listening to this talk. Um, just it, when I was told I need to do, do an inaugural lecture and that it should be a little more general and not too specific about my work. Um, I was just wondering how, how I was going to condense everything into the time that is required. I then recalled many years ago uh, at a lecture, someone mentioned that the best talk is one that has a very good beginning and a very good ending. And both of these should be as close as possible. So I will try to be as succinct as I can and put in all I can in this time that is allotted to me. My talk is entitled From Clusters to Stars. It's all about delivery. And basically that covers my research to date on nanomedicine and looking at nanoparticles in the delivery of genes and drugs. Now, before I, I start everything, okay. Uh, I, I want to briefly have a glimpse at my journey. We're going to look at the past and what I actually did during the past, uh, present, and then go into my future research along in this journey of mine. Now, before we go into the journey, I would like to give a, a brief background on my early life. I was born many moons ago. I'm not telling you the date because you might calculate my age, in Silver Glen, which is a suburb of Chatsworth, and where I still live. So I can probably say that I am made in Chatsworth. And this is a, a, a book by a very well-known author called, called Kiru Naidu. So I am also part of this Chatsworth family. Chatsworth is home to the very iconic landmark which is the Bangladesh uh, sorry which is the uh, Iskwan temple and not forgetting the buzzing Bangladesh market where people go for their fresh produce every week and it's where you meet people 
of all classes in that particular venue. I started my education all in Chatsworth in two primary schools. I went to Summit Primary and to Depper Road Memorial School. And thereafter rounded off my tertiary education at the Glenova Secondary School. As uh, the Dean already mentioned, I graduated at the old UDW with my BSc, Masters and Honors degrees and got qualified with, the, with my PhD from the, uh, at that time, the newly merged University of KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, I started off as a, as a, a junior lab assistant in, in the old UDW and then worked my way up to becoming a professor. Now, during this time, I married my husband of now over 30 years, Professor Subhu Singh, who is in the chemistry department and had two wonderful children, uh, both of whom are now graduated and have engineering qualifications. So this road of mine was quite a long road and it was one step at a time. And many years ago, my postgrads often asked me, Prof, how did you manage to uh, balance your work life with your home life? And one of the things that did pop up during this time was that it was just coincidental that when I finished my honors degree, my son was born. And then when I completed my master's degree and ended in my thesis in the same month, my daughter was born. So the question that followed from them was, what happened after you got your PhD? So what I said was, what else could I do? I bought myself a dog. So now it's been 35 years that I'm at this university. So it's been a long, long road at UKZN. And coincidentally, just looking at these stairs, and there's a picture of my lovely dog. And looking at this picture of these stairs uh, reminds me that today uh, I'm sitting here at the fourth floor of the biochemistry department and our lift is still out of order. It means I still have to walk one step at a time up to my office. Now, looking at my career and basically my research, and I'll try to be as, as simple as possible without going into very great uh, information. Uh, my research started in the area of gene therapy. And it, it, this is the active area of gene therapy. And many people would have heard by now of DNA and obviously mRNA since that has been used in the COVID vaccine. And one of the things that's very important with gene therapy is obviously we're looking at genes and genes in certain diseases can be turned on and they can be turned off. So th that is what our research is basically involved. And this whole area of gene therapy would not be possible without the expert guidance of my supervisor of many years, Professor, who is now Emeritus Professor Mario Ariati. And without him taking me on and giving me this opportunity, I probably would not be here to speak this morning or this afternoon, sorry. Now, to those of you who are not familiar with what gene therapy is all about, now gene therapy originally started with looking at replacing a gene, a faulty gene with a good gene. And I just put an example of a human pyramid where one individual faints and then an healthy individual will take his place. That is very simply put what gene therapy is all about. But however, with, with knowledge and with uh, time, uh, science does evolve and things have changed. And gene therapy now has been extended to include the silencing of genes, the editing of genes, the repair of genes, among many other processes as well. And it's important to note that there are successes that have been noted in gene therapy. And one of them being uh, hemophilia, where there have been cures noted in, in those uh, diseases. Now to date, 
like most uh, studies, there are skeptics and there are believers in gene therapy as well. Now I've put this uh, little pie diagram to show what the areas that gene therapy uh, basically looks at. And gene therapy started off looking at single genetic disorders, which we call monogenic genetic diseases. But what has happened is that this has been taken over by cancer, which now marks this big chunk of this pie. And cancer is the, a region that we basically also focus our gene therapy research on. And to carry out this gene therapy research, we would need vehicles to carry our genes into the cells. And these vehicles can be either viral vehicles or non-viral vehicles. Now the viral vehicles are be, are be, have been the most popular to date, but they have disadvantages. So we basically concentrate on looking at non-viral vehicles and a non-viral carrier route to the cells. And looking at non-viral vehicles, our very first research was based on liposomes. So liposomes were the first thing that I ever looked at, I ever worked at wood. And just to detract a bit, uh, liposomes, because they are made from lipids and much of the liposomes resembles biological membranes, these liposomes have been uh, have been thought to be very good biological carriers, especially for skincare and beauty items. So many cosmetics have been formulated with using liposome technology. So there has been, it has been used and, and they are on the market currently as well. Now, the lipids that we use, are, are, we have normally made our own lipids. And again, lipids have been very popular recently because they have been employed as well to carry the uh, vaccine or the mRNA vaccine. So they've been used as a carrier for that particular vaccine as well. And we're looking at lipids, formulation of lipids. And to date, we have formulated many lipid nanoparticles that are, uh, uh, sorry, lipids that are novel. And these lipids have been formulated into liposomal formulations. Now, just for the chemists and the biochemists out there, these are the two structures of the lipids that we formulated that were used extensively over the past few years. So we've used them in many studies by many students over the years. And emanating from all this work with the liposomes, we published several papers dating back from 2000, way back, way into 2021, which is this our last paper that we published on liposomes. So there were, it was just a continuous trend of publications in the liposomal area. From 2010 onwards, we started looking at inorganic nanoparticles. And more specifically, we started with metal nanoparticles. Now, metal nanoparticles are extremely promising because they are generally non-toxic. They are chemically inert. They are biocompatible. They have excellent physical chemical properties. And the, what's very exciting, especially in cancer research, is that metallic nanoparticles offer the prospect of peronostics, which means that you can use them for therapeutic basis or for imaging as well. And so this is actually brought about quite a novel process called peronostics at the moment. Now, what is this whole area that I'm working with? It, it falls within the nanotechnology uh, area. And most people have heard of nanotechnology, which employs nanoparticles for various applications. And what I put here are all the applications, or maybe more than this, that are used, uh, that are currently being done in nanotechnology itself. So these nanoparticles can be used from things like textiles way down to defense and cosmetics, et cetera. 
But for us, what is important is the use of these nanoparticles in drugs and gene delivery. And I have mentioned nanoparticles. And to those out there would wonder, what are these nanoparticles? Now, nanoparticles are small particles, basically nano-sized particles. And they can range from anything from one nanometer to hundreds of nanometers. And the chemical and physical properties of these nanoparticles are not exactly the same as their element or their bulk product bulk starting material. They slightly differ, especially in the chemical and physical properties. Now nanoparticles based on their uh, composition and according to the American Society for Testing and Materials can be divided into three classes. One being the inorganic nanoparticles which comprises your metals such as your gold, copper, silver, etc. your metal oxides, such as your iron oxide and your quantum dots as well. Now your carbon-based nanoparticles, these include things like your carbon nanotubes, your fullerenes and your graphenes. And again, we have organic nanoparticles, which involve our liposomes, lipids, various lipids, polymers, etc. Now, for us, what was important was the inorganic nanoparticles and the organic nanoparticles. And sometimes we have used a combination of both of them. Here, I basically show a few of these nanoparticles that have been published to date in the area of drug, drug and gene delivery. And what's uh, nice to note is that gold nanocrystals are presently uh, in the process of clinical trials for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. So the results of that obviously will be uh, coming out quite soon. Now, looking at our laboratory and what we are basically working with, we work with many different types of nanoparticles. And this is because many students uh, like to work with certain uh, material and uh, not to hold them back. We allow thinking out of the box. So students tend to like to work with, with a specific type of nanoparticles. But the most popular to date are gold nanoparticles and selenium nanoparticles, which we have many students in the lab working with. The other nanoparticles here are having black. These nanoparticles, we do have students, but they are not many, maybe one or two students that work with them. We also work, started work with lipid nanoparticles and titanium nanoparticles, which I'll mention uh, towards the end. And these are, have just been started last year and this year. So the, those are very, very novel nanoparticles that we are working with. And just to, I put these pictures on the side so that people would, would see that when I speak about gold nanoparticles, I'm just not talking about the gold itself. We are looking at them in a colloidal solution and gold in colloidal solution is wine red in color. And these are spherical gold nanoparticles. Now for us, what's very important is to look at how we're gonna take these nanoparticles into the cells, because that's the main aim is to treat the cells. And for that, we have to look at various factors that govern the interaction of the nanoparticle with the cell. And one of them is size. Now size of the nanoparticles will determine how they will interact with the cells, how they will get into the, to the cells, the tissues, the organs, because many of these organs have barriers. And one of the most popular barrier, especially in the brain, is a blood-brain barrier, which most particles cannot get through. So it's there to protect the brain. So we need our nanoparticles, if we are doing delivery, to be able to pass through these important barriers. We also look at how we're gonna modify, as I say, surface decorations, decorate the particle on the outside, and this is very important, especially for us, if we are going to bind various molecules on the outside, we look at how we're gonna add uh, molecules that can target specific cells, how we're gonna add molecules that are going to protect the uh, particle within the cell as well. So we also look at adding of imaging agents, et cetera, to the nanoparticle. Uh, shape 
is the other other uh, factor that determines the entry of this of these nanoparticles into the cells. We have different shapes of nanoparticles, and all of them have their application, obviously, in different uh, cell types as well. Now, talking about shapes and sizes. And as my topic was about clusters to stars, and I hope nobody thought that I was talking about the night sky, I was basically talking about the shapes of my gold nano nanoparticles. So where we have, we have worked with nanospheres, we have worked with nanoclusters, and now we are basically moving into nanostars. So go, there are various shapes of all nanoparticles. Now, as I mentioned, gold is wine red in color, so as the nanoparticle size increases, the color of the gold colloid also changes during this time. And in addition, if you have different shapes of those nanoparticles, again, we have different colors being produced due to the uh, colloid that is produced in these cases. Now, what is important, as I mentioned, modification of your nanoparticles. So this is a very important aspect to our research to look at what we can use to modify these nanoparticles. And as such, these nanoparticles have been likened to a Swiss army knife, where in a Swiss army knife, you have many uh, gadgets to it, and they are multifunctional, where you can do many things with this one knife. So we expect our nanoparticle to be able to do multiple uh, functions. And amongst them, to be cell-specific targeting. We, we can target the, the cells with them. We can use, uh, use them for controlled drug release and also for detection in the system by adding various fluorescent molecules to them. And obviously to add our drugs and genes as well on the outside for them to be delivered into the cell. Now, before I go into the main uh, area of my gold nanoparticle work. Uh, just to detract a bit on gold, which is a very, very important metal and why we would think of its therapeutic uses. Now in the middle ages, uh, base metals were, were converted to gold, were, were thought to be converted to the legend, converted to gold using the philosopher's stone. And those of you who have read Harry Potter would know what Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone as well. Now, this Philosopher's Stone is a ruby red stone, and it was thought to produce what is known as the elixir of life. Now, gold itself, as many ancient cultures uh, thought gold was, in the Incas thought they were tears of the sun or sweat of the sun, and many cultures worshiped the sun because obviously the sun and the glow of gold was thought to bring warmth into the life and also producing some life-giving properties. And gold was often seen as the earthly form of the sun. So many people obviously made use gold as well to make ornaments to protect them from the evil eye as well. Now, very interestingly, in the 16th century, alchemists started making drinkable gold. And when they made this royalty, obviously they're the ones who can afford it. Women of royalty tended to drink this, this gold and they wanted to add to the luster of their beauty and to bring about youth. And it is known that the French elite especially used uh, gold for as an anti-aging serum. And it was found later that when these women died, gold tend to precipitate out into their hair, strands of the hair. And also there were cases where they found uh, gold in the tongue as well. And one of the most common uses of nanotechnology and in mid was seen in medieval uh, stained glass windows in churches. Now these medieval stained glass windows are an example of how nanotechnology was actually used in the pre-modern era. Now these glasses generally show a very translucent ruby red color when you use transmitted light and in reflected light, 
it gives you a green color. And this is all possible because of the presence of gold colloids within that particular glass windows. Now, what, what they is assumed by using these gold in these windows is that when this gold was uh, energized by the sun, it purified the air within the churches. Now, gold is part of our culture. We all use gold, its brilliance, its natural beauty, its luster and its great malleability and resistance to tarnish has made it very popular. So everybody loves gold, but this gold that we talk about is different from the gold nanoparticles that I'm using for my delivery work. And they, are, they retain some of the favorable properties of the gold themselves, but are chemically and physically different, allowing them to be used as nano carriers of drugs and genes. I thought I would be amiss if I did not acknowledge the two ladies that were at the forefront in my department or in my laboratory of starting the gold nanoparticle, uh, starting nanoparticle work. Um, the first one is Dr. Geraldine Lazarus now, who did this during a, a PhD study. She was the first one to start research on gold nanoparticles. And her work was has now been taken up by many students. So she has basically laid the foundation for gold nanoparticle research in the department. Dr. Lazarus now currently works as a pharmaceutical chemist at Ascendus Health uh, in, 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 in Kauteng. Now she has published from her work, many papers as well. So we have to thank Dr. Lazarus for the start of this particular era of gold nanoparticle research. The other student is Dr. Piano Mayo, who also started the work during a PhD studies. And she started and uh, was very interested in using selenium nanoparticles. And we, she took on the job of making selenium nanoparticles. And obviously, again, she uh, published many works from that particular research in a PhD. Dr. Mayo now is an academic in Kenya. And again, we have to thank her for laying the foundation for the work of selenium nanoparticles, which I will show some of the research that we have done with that um, a little later on. Now, if I have to break my research into two areas, I can, one would be the gene delivery aspect, where we look at uh, the delivery of DNA molecules and RNA, where we deliver small interfering RNA and mRNA or messenger RNA molecules. And then we can look at the area of drug delivery, where we use nanoparticles to deliver various anti-cancer drugs. And these drugs will depend upon which uh, type of cancer we are looking at. And we've also, embarked upon looking at a combination of gene and drug delivery and a combination of dual drug delivery. Now, I'm just going to go uh, on about two um, areas. One is the drug delivery aspect. And the first drug that we uh, published with drug delivery was doxorubicin. And doxorubicin is a chemotherapeutic drug which blocks the action of an enzyme, which is needed by cancer cells for them to grow and multiply within the body. So in essence, they will kill the, the, those cancer cells. Now, the, our first study was done using uh, bimetallic nanoparticles and we used platinum gold. And the reason why we used platinum gold was we thought that we combined the good properties of two different uh, metals. So we looked at the non-toxic biodegradable properties of gold and combined them with the anti-cancer properties of platinum. And as we know, platinum is used in the drug uh, cisplatin, which is a cancer, uh, a chemotherapeutic drug. So this work was started uh, by uh, Varish Mani, who basically published that research as well. Now, talking about that nanoparticle, 
just to give an indication what we meant by bimetallic is that we had a core of gold and that was covered by a shell of platinum and encased in all of that was a matrix of chitosan. And chitosan is a biodegradable polymer, which we use quite often to coat our nanoparticles. And encased in the matrix of this chitosan molecule, we have doxorubicin in that. So doxorubicin was carried in this bimetallic nanoparticle. And when, once we do drug de delivery, we have to look at the encapsulation, how much of drug was encapsulated by the nanoparticle. And again, if we look at this EM, EM picture, we can see that these nanoparticles were all spherical in shape. And our drug encapsulation for this uh, research here was over 65%. And now we tend to get much higher encapsulation as well because things get optimized over the years. Once we have got the, the drug bound, the next thing we would look at is basically how the drug is going to be released from that particular nanoparticle. Now we don't want the nanoparticle not to release our drug. And we do that drug release at various pHs. And the, the thinking behind using different pH is that at physiological pH is what is normal in the body. And the acidic pH, which is very low, is what you'd normally find in a tumor microenvironment. So most tumor cells have low pHs. And from this study, what we did take away was that you can see more drug being released in the, in, at low pH, which means more will go into the cancer cell than at normal pH, which is your normal cells. So we hope that we would get less side effects of a chemotherapeutic drug in normal cells using the nanoparticle approach. And obviously to, to confirm that we would do anti-cancer studies and obviously looking at cytotoxicity of our nanoparticles. And what we did see was that we do, we do work with uh, a normal cell line, which in this case we use kidney cells and we do hep G2 cells, which are liver cancer cells. And what we look at is the toxicity of these nanoparticles. And from yet we can see our nanoparticles on their own don't have any toxicity in the cells. But doxorubicin is very, very toxic to normal cell lines and ends the side effects that is associated with chemotherapy. And when we look at the liver cell, we could see that our nanoparticles with the drugs have better or equal uh, effect as the doxorubicin. So we were able to show that we had good anti-cancer activity using our nanoparticles. Now, generally what we do when we have cell death, we have to look at how the cell dies. And for that, I put up uh, some visual uh, fluorescence images, which is more appealing than looking at graphs. And from here, what we can see is that cells have different colors and different fluorescence. And that basically tells us that cells are at different stage of cell death. Now, generally cells that are orange, yellow, uh, or, or bright uh, green are, are moving towards the cell death stages. And one of the main cell deaths is apoptosis, which is actually natural cell death in the body. When the cells cannot be repaired, they die by this process of apoptosis. So you can see here various cells from red, orange and yellow, and these all signify various stages of cell death. And this basically confirms our results that we get with the anti-cancer studies. And now to look at uh, the gene delivery aspect. Now, one of the, we've done a lot with DNA and I'm not going to look at DNA. I'm just going to look at the two more difficult uh, nucleic acids to deliver. And these are siRNA and messenger RNA. So siRNA research was started by, um, I mean, we started that many years ago, looking at proof of principle studies, just to show that the siRNA can be taken into the cells. And Dr. Daniels is now postdoc, uh, did this during a, 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 a PhD studies. 
and she looked at silencing of the MYC gene in a breast cancer cell model. And what she did show was that we were able to produce up to 90% silencing of that particular gene. And as you can see in these graphs. So she was able to successfully show, and we published this data of 90% gene silencing of the CMYC gene. Now this gene is very highly expressed on cancer cells. So that one of the reasons why it was targeted for gene silencing. We also did uh, mRNA delivery and our research in mRNA started um, way back in 2014 when we had our collaborative uh, funding with Freya University in Brussels, who basically provided us with the first mRNA uh, molecules to work with. Um, and, and since then, the interest in mRNA has increased in the lab, and it's very important because we know that mRNA holds a lot of uh, potential, especially for its application in vaccination and cancer immunotherapy. And in the case of vaccination, we all know that mRNA has been highlighted now due to the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, for, for the mRNA delivery, many students have taken it over. And, uh, and here we have Dureshan Singh, who did his master's looking at the delivery of mRNA for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. So he looked at liver cancer. And we had Londiwa Mbata, who looked at delivery of uh, the, these uh, nanoparticles using, she used gold nanoparticles for the delivery of messenger RNA molecules. And she used a folate as a molecule to target the breast cancer cells, as well as the HeLa derived KB cells. So basically what they had was in both cases, they would have had their gold or selenium in the middle and they would have coated it with a polymer. In this case, it would have been a chitosan polymer. In her case, it would have been a dendroma on the outside. And they would have had targeting molecules all on the outside of those particular nanoparticles. Now, when we do gene delivery, there are various things that we have to do. And before I go into that, I just want to briefly mention why mRNA. And since mRNA is now, like everybody heard of mRNA, when we have mRNA linked to our nanoparticle, it's taken up by the cell. And if we have specific receptors, it gets taken up by receptor mediated uptake. And once in the cell, this mRNA is then released from the nanoparticle. And I'm giving you a very simplified version. I'm not talking about all the different organelles in the cell. It's released. And when it mRNA is released, that gene in the mRNA is translated to produce the various proteins that we require. And amongst them is the therapeutic gene that we need for the cell. Now, we could use DNA to do the same purpose. Now, DNA would have to go into the cell exactly like the mRNA would, but DNA, on the other hand, will need to go into this organelle of the cell, which is the nucleus. And obviously, the nuclear barrier is another issue that needs to be dealt with. So to avoid all these problems, we went with mRNA. And further on, once DNA gets into the nucleus, it still has to produce mRNA, and thereafter, it translated to produce the therapeutic protein. So the process of mRNA delivery for the therapeutic effect is much shorter. Now, when we look at the nucleic acid, it could be mRNA or DNA. The first thing we would do is look at how much of the nanoparticle we need to bind our, our nucleic acid. And for that, we do binding studies. And we also look at whether that mRNA or DNA is protected from digestion within the body. Because once your nucleic acid gets into the body and it's, it's not bound with anything or protected, that nucleic acid would be degraded by a lot of enzymes in the body. So hence, we look at protection against the various enzymes. So upon getting that, we then look at the toxicity 
of these nanoparticles and whether they're toxic to the body because we don't want them to kill the cells before taking in our gene of interest. So as you can see here, these nanoparticles, these are the selenium nanoparticles, are very non-toxic to the cell, which is what we actually want. And what's of greatest interest to us is the expression of that gene in the cell. And we look at whether we get targeted expression in the specific cell. If we wanted to go to the liver, we want to see whether it only went to the liver cells or whether it, get, it, it did not uh, go specifically to the liver cells. We normally test more than one cell line and we will see that there's more uh, uptake in the liver cells in this case. And what this is simplified version that I've put here for those who uh, would not know what uh, we talk about receptors. Now, generally cells would have a lot of molecules or surface receptors uh, that have particular conformations. Now, when we make our nanoparticle, we add on the outside of the, sur on the surface of the nanoparticle, a molecule that is complementary to that particular receptor, similar to a lock and key mechanism. And what we expect is that once a nanoparticle joins this receptor, it will be taken into the cell and then produce what we call receptor mediated uptake of the nanoparticle and ends the gene with that particular nanoparticle. So in both the cases with the gold nanoparticle and with the uh, a selenium nanoparticle, we were able to successfully show that we had uh, gene expression and we had receptor mediated gene expression in that process. Now, uh, before I forget, those two papers that I showed you for the gene for the selenium and the gold are both papers that are now being uh, nominated for best cited papers in uh, pharm pharmaceutics for the year 2021. And I think the result will only be out next year. Now, looking at the present and the future, uh, at the moment, Diresh and Singh again was continued with these selenium nanoparticle work. And he is looking at CRISPR-Cat gene editing. And he's identified a gene in neuroglastoma cells that he is going to look at for CRISPR-Cas editing. And then not to forget, our uh, work on uh, immunotherapeutics. Uh, we have Janine Venkatas, who's working on gold nanoparticles, and more specifically for cytokine delivery in uh, cervical cancer cells and, and in the process of immunotherapy. And as I mentioned, my talk is about gold nanoclusters and gold nanostars. And we are using gold nanostars which is with the aid of Janani Padiachi, who started the work with gold nanostars. And most of these PhD work are now uh, reaching a conclusion. And she used gold nanostars for delivery uh, and gene silencing in triple negative breast cancers. Now, what is important is what are gold nanoclusters? Now, gold nanoclusters are ultra small nanoparticles, and they can have up to 100 atoms in that one particular molecule. And they are sometimes called molecules as well. They are much smaller in diameter than the spherical gold nanoparticles that we have. Now, considering that a these uh, gold nanoclusters absorb light in the near infrared range, that's normally between 650 and 900 nanometers, they have been exceptionally important for the use in cancer diagnostics. So that is where the reason why one of the things we looked at was gold nanoclusters. Now, gold nanoclusters, these are the gold nanoclusters that we synthesized. And if you look at the images in visible light, gold nanoclusters have a very pale color. But when you put them under UV light, they fluoresce quite strongly. So you'll be able to put them in the system and you'll be able to pick up uh, these gold nanoparticle, um, in these gold nanoclusters along the way. Now, gold, we also use them for what we call photothermal therapy, and that was one of the initiation, uh, initial reasons we started with these uh, luminescent type of nanoparticles, is to use them for photothermal therapy. 
Now, phototermal therapy uses uh, near infrared lights, so they, they are irradiate, you irradiate your nanoparticles and cells with these lights and this lasers. And what happens is that you tend to get better distribution of your uh, therapeutic and higher therapeutic indices uh, as well. So without going into detail on that, um, these gold nanoclusters can be used for that particular purpose. Now, importantly, these near-infrared lasers, the wavelengths that they use are be is between optical and X-rays, so they are armless to antibody cells. But this is now compared to other uh, wavelengths that are used for uh, various other medicinal processes, the near-infrared is quite armless. Now, this has opened up a, an opportunity for us to look at a combined gene and drug delivery together with phototermal therapy. Now, just to go to other novel approaches that we are currently uh, looking at, uh, Mr. Keelan Jagaran has started with solid lipid nanoparticles and is looking at gene silencing in a Parkinsonian cell model. And he just published this paper last month on the solid lipid nanoparticles. And we also have two master's students who, during the, who started during the COVID era, and both of them were very excited about the ACE2 receptor, which is this is a receptor via which the coronavirus enters the cells, especially the lung cells. So they took on research where we're looking at delivery via the ACE2 receptor. So Asina Makada started with looking at the microRNA delivery and uh, Dylan Sivalingam is looking at the delivery of uh, drugs to via the ACE2 receptor. Another very exciting area we are looking at now is the use of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles uh, were started with, by Samantha Ludic, who started the MSC this year, and uh, ably assisted by uh, our postdoc, Dr. Dr. Daniels. And she has produced these titanium nanoparticles, and thanks EM unit again for producing these nanoparticle images for us. And we have tested these already on many, many cell lines. And to date, we have yet to find much toxicity of these nanoparticles. And it is expected because you can see that these titanium dioxide nanoparticles have been used in paints, cosmetics, and food additives as well. And not to forget that my talk was about clusters to stars. So I will end off with stars. And so our future basically lies in stars at the moment. And this work research was taken over by Dr. Safia Abib, who is our postdoc. And she has made gold nano stars. And again, I would like to thank EM Unit for producing these images that uh, we are able to present on time our synthesized gold nanostars. Now, these nanostars are now going to be taken up further, optimized for delivery purposes, and we're going to look at publishing this work as soon as we can. Now, to round off, I'd like to acknowledge the many people that have crossed my path, the many people that were instrumental in. Uh, some of the funding that I, I achieved, people that collaborated with me, people that uh, published with me over the many years. And I'd like to thank them all for the input without whom I would not, without which I would not, it not be possible. I also would like to thank my family my, and my friends who have always supported me over the years and they all know who they are. And I really appreciate their support continuously and my well wishes who have sent me messages of congratulations. And I thank you all for your good messages and obviously even your plural contributions as well. I thank you all. And with, I, I will be amiss if I do not acknowledge more importantly, the funders, the NRF and the BRICS Foundation for funding me for this project and for many of the other projects that we've undertaken and the three, the ladies of my department, uh, the technician and the postdocs, and not forgetting my current PhD students and master's students in the lab. 
And these are all my postgrad, past and present, some pictures I don't have, but all of them, I thank all of them, the past students and the present students for their contributions in the advancement of my research. And these are actually the, th the, the true nanostars of the drug and gene delivery laboratory. And with that, I'd like to say thank you, and I'd leave you with the funny side of gene therapy. Thank you. An amazing woman, our future lies in stars. If you don't mind, Moggy, please don't hide your face as I say the last words at the end of your presentation. Uh, it is now my great pleasure um, to get this opportunity to say thank you to everybody. Almost 100 people have been listening to you. They were attracted by your topic. I'm sure many of them knew what they were going to hear and many more did not know the amazing work that you do. Excellent illustration of the importance of collaboration. Excellent illustration of how a professor is mentoring young people while working with international collaborators overseas. Excellent illustration of why is it that people say it is not easy to be a professor at UKZN. This is a UKZN professor and colleagues you've seen for yourselves, this is work that has got a very, very long way to go in terms of its impact across the board. Uh, I'm sure you saw how um, everybody in chemistry and physics, uh, in biotechnology, uh, that is found in plant sciences and elsewhere in engineering can find a friend. I'm hoping that many of us are going to come to you with some applications so that we can collaborate. Thank you very much for such an exciting talk. I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank everyone who worked with you and encourage them to continue to work with you, your students in particular. Um, Thanks to the people who funded your, your work um, on behalf of the university. I would like them to continue to do so and we will assist you as a university to find more research uh, if you come to us and there's a need for that, more research funds. Um, colleagues, the family of this woman deserves many, many thanks. They gave her to us. So thank you very much um, for giving us a special woman uh, who is a professor of UKZN. And to everyone else that I didn't mention, please remember, I did not leave you out. Everyone present and absent, um, thank you very much for making this day happen. Congratulations, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.